You wanna come? You wanna come film? Okay. Hi, hello. My name is Anne. If you're new here, I'm a final year PhD student studying nanomedicine and drug delivery at the University of British Columbia. I am going to be telling you things slash habits that I have developed and followed that really helped me survive my PhD. Let's just get right into it. So number one thing that helped me get through my PhD has to be my freaking support system. It, it's a team effort, people. And you think that like when one person walks across the stage getting their PhD is because of them, that is not the case. There are so many people that are in the background giving me support, holding me up when I'm falling down, picking me up when I fell down. I have no Jude. So my lab mate turned best friend slash soulmate. She will be a significant part of my life forever without her i genuinely do not know what kind of mental state i would be in hero has decided to just okay he's gonna be right here as i feel anyways yeah no jude thank you so much you know how much i love you not gonna get into it because i will cry her and then my my other lab mates obviously have created like such an incredible environment for me to grow to suffer to explore and to just finish this phd you all know who you are obviously my partner he's the one that has to deal with all of my emotional breakdowns and all of this anxiety and stuff before this turns into a freaking dedication video i think we should just move on so in summation the first thing that really helped me get through my phd is the support network both in the lab outside the lab my family my friends friends, my partner, and no Jude. <laughs> okay, the next thing that I think really, really helped me every time I went through a period of burnout or low motivation and obviously I had to get back up, like the thing that really helped me shorten that time between falling down and getting back up is the discipline that I set for myself. I think I'm a very routine person, so that really helped me in a way because getting into a routine is necessary for me to function as a human being. I refused to work too long past 5 p.m. I refused to work unnecessarily on the weekends if I don't have to be there. Like if I absolutely don't have to be there, I will not be there. You know, overworking is so romanticized. It's ridiculous, especially in academia. Like you'll hear really often people flaunting that, oh, like, you know, I didn't sleep because I was working. Or like, I, I was in the lab all weekend, like da 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 da. And it's, it's something to be proud of, but I actually think quite the opposite. I think that taking care of yourself and placing that boundary is so important for you to maintain your mental health, to maintain balance in your life, to give you time to reset and to think and to, you know, just live. I've been an advocate for work-life balance since I don't know when, like since I suffered in first year from, you know, spiraling from not doing that or not implementing that strongly. Talking to other graduate students, it might not come easy for some people to, as soon as you leave the building, to turn off your brain and stop thinking about your project. Because I understand, like, it's a huge component of your life and is very important to you. And during your PhD, this is your life. That experiment is your life. To switch that off, it's it could be challenging so things that really helped me switch that off is setting in a daily routine so in the morning I would designate that time for exercise so six days a week I exercise whether that be like a run a short run a long run some kind of like health goal that I have for myself usually I'm running because I really like to run and then I would supplement that with short body weight workouts like at home body weight workouts so just implementing exercise into my my daily routine that's my morning i also have a chunk of my morning set for whatever creative hobby I'm pursuing. Earlier on in my PhD, I was really into photography. The morning would be the time that I would be editing my photos or planning photo shoots and stuff. And then as I like ventured into the world of video editing and YouTube, like now the morning is designated to video editing and then working out. So then that's my me time. And then continuing on after work, I would go home and 
spend time with my partner so we would cook together have dinner together watch like an episode of something together and then the remainder of the time that I have left before bedtime I would also be editing having something to return home to that I'm excited about that's you know my partner hero and my video editing really makes it easy to leave the lab and turn off my brain with regards to experiments I highly encourage some kind of extracurricular thing that you can work towards that you're excited about outside of your research and part of that routine has to do with winding down for sleep so I have noticed that days where I'm in the lab past 6 or 7 p.m. working I really have a hard time turning off my brain and that's because I think my body and my brain need X number of hours to wind down and get ready for bed this is super important because for me I don't function without sleep like I can't function like I'm just a completely different person in terms of like my mood my outlook on life my energy levels I'm just completely different if I don't get my sleep so that's another motivation when it's when it's time to leave the lab and I'm done my experiments like I, I'm not gonna stay and do an extra experiment because I need to start my <laughs> As silly as it sounds, I need to start getting ready for bed because sleep is so important. So my nighttime routine, don't laugh. Don't laugh at me. Don't laugh at me. I know I'm going to get judged for this because I've been judged before, but this works for me, okay? So just let me do whatever works for me. But because my partner and I get up around 5 or 5.30 in the morning to do our morning shenanigans because he also works out, so our schedules align really nicely, I like to wind down have screens off and everything by 8 30 p.m so i know that's really early and i just just whatever judgment you're you have to me just just stop right there okay thank you so at 8 30 i'll shut off all my screens i'll text my mom good night and just that's no phones or any type of screen from there on out so i'll slowly you know get ready for bed wash take this guy down to use the bathroom and then i will end up in bed around nine and that's when i get to read so I read for about 15 to 30 minutes and then I'll, I'll fall asleep so I'll get sleepy. If lights are out by 9.30 or 9.45, I'll wake up feeling better and like re-energized. So that's my nighttime routine. Prioritizing sleep and prioritizing the quality of sleep really is was crucial in me getting up every morning and starting the day again. <laughs> no matter what kind of failed experiment I'm going into work too. A lot of you were here with me last January when I first started up my kind of monthly goal sharing. Like that was really crucial for the progress that I made this year. In a year, I was able to finish the rest of my thesis aims. And mind you, I think like at the beginning of January last year, like I was I was in a state. I was in low motivation. I was just not in a good place from what I remember because of like COVID and the lockdown and all that stuff. But then come January when I started to set monthly goals, these little goals really helped me get motivated again, get excited about my research again. And I think that this is really important because when you're doing a PhD, it's a big freaking goal like really really big if you look at your thesis aims it looks for me it, it felt impossible to get there because like what the heck how can i do all of this i think the scariest part in doing this goal setting thing is actually sitting down and being honest with yourself and like breaking down the big goals into like yearly goals into like monthly goals into like okay what do i need to do this week like that part was difficult but then once those monthly goals were set and each month just kept coming and and I could actively see I'm making strides like really good strides towards my goals and towards like the end of my thesis that gave me motivation and inspiration to continue so I think monthly goals or some kind of goal setting smart goals as as what they're called I forget what the acronym stands for wait okay let me let me look up this acronym because the type of goals that you set also really matter so 
So SMART is the mnemonic acronym for... I'll put up on the screen this table that I'm looking at. Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. So set goals, please. That really helped me in my PhD. Next thing. This is how I deal with problems and stuff. So when an experiment fails or it's just one of those days where literally nothing in the lab is working and everything's going wrong, I, th I think there are different types of people and everyone responds to this differently. But for me, what helped was to just literally just, just, just drop it, just leave it like in a huff, you shut it down, you go home. Go home, spend time away from it, like like you know, whatever amount of time you have left of that day, just just if it stopped working at noon, just just freaking quit, go home and reset. Because this is for me, okay? This is for me at least. I think everyone has their own way of dealing with this. When something fails and I put a lot of time and effort into it. I will get upset. When I get upset, I start to spiral. All these emotions start to take over and I'm no longer capable of thinking logically and reasonably and I'm more likely to make rash decisions. So I know that for myself, when these things happen, it's better for me to just shut it down, take a step away from it, go home, relax, and come back the next day with like a fresh mind and a better attitude to fix a problem. So that's what worked for me, but I think it's really important during your PhD You I think you'll come across it too when you come up with problems and stuff and you have to troubleshoot Take a step back and kind of observe Try to be like viewing yourself, viewing your emotions, viewing your thoughts from a third person perspective And kind of analyze what you need in that situation And this will help you better understand what kind of responder you are when things go to shit because they will go to shit a lot during your PhD and once you understand that every time that you know something blows up again like there's a protocol for you to follow so for me that protocol I stuck to that like every time I felt like it's too much I would just leave and come back and always 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 when I come back it's a lot better <laughs> it just like makes the problem smaller for me when I give it a little bit of time and a little bit of perspective rather than deal trying to deal with it in the moment the main message here is understand and think Think about what kind of troubleshooter are you? What do you need to do in a moment of confusion and frustration and anger towards your science? What do you need to recover from that? And then come up with a protocol that you can follow. Kind of like the final thing that I thought of because I made this list here of the things and habits that helped me survive my PhD was asking for help and asking for help specifically from my boss. So I've said on here like before, but I really feel that I lucked out really, really, really hard with the supervisor that I got. So Dr. Lee has been amazing as my mentor. I think our relationship has also evolved a lot over the past four years. And initially I was very afraid of him, intimidated by him and like didn't really understand his demeanor. Is demeanor the right word? Sometimes I use words I'm not even sure. Quiet, somber, outward behavior. Yeah, so I didn't understand his demeanor. I'm a very like chatty, I've been described as overly friendly by Noju when I first met her. And so meeting him, like he's more quiet and, you know, like very efficient at using words. So he uses very little words in his emails and stuff. So getting used to his demeanor at first, it took a bit of time to understand that this is how he is. So I was really scared of him in the beginning. And I was really scared to admit if I didn't know anything, if I needed help with anything. But then over the years, like I noticed that he's very receptive to whenever I have some kind of feedback about how he's been communicating or like what I need as a student. He's been really receptive towards that. And I think he's grown a lot as a supervisor as well. So during the times when I was in the lower points of my PhD, being transparent with him, no matter how uncomfortable it was, because every time that I'm going through something like very emotional, it's really, 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 really freaking hard to admit to your superior that you're struggling. But I think I'm not the type of person that can hide when I'm struggling. And when I'm struggling, I can't just compartmentalize that and like put it aside for a little bit and focus on something else. So it's, it's all consuming when I need help. Every time that I've opened up to him about it, he's been 
been super understanding and gave really good suggestions on what I should be, you know, doing to get back on track, to heal, to recover, giving me time to recover. And I know that this might not be achievable with some student supervisor relationship so i acknowledge that like i'm so privileged and so lucky to be in this situation but if you can't ask for help from your boss or if you don't feel comfortable enough then there usually are resources on campus that you can talk to at ubc at least there's like free counseling now at the pharmaceutical sciences faculty there's in-house counseling so again i i recognize the privilege that I have in being at an, a faculty and a school that really prioritizes mental health but knowing when to ask for help really really made my PhD because if I didn't ask for help I don't know where I would be so it's a tough pill to swallow when you have to ask for help or to admit that you're struggling but the alternative to that is not asking for help and just suffering by yourself and usually that's very difficult like you're worth way more than that you're worth more than your pride and your ego I guess so if you need help, ask for help. Okay, so I think that's everything. As you can see, I'm sitting down here because, ugh, you know, everything else is a mess right now. Everything that we own is kind of all over the place because right after I film this video, I'm going to be packing my life away. We're moving out tomorrow and yeah. Let me know in the comments if you have any other things slash habits that are helping you survive your PhD or have helped you survive your PhD. I would really love to hear it and I'm sure other PhD doers will also appreciate that. So with that, Hero has woken up from his nap. And you're ready to play? Are you ready to play? <gasps> come here, come here, come here. With that, we're gonna say thank you. Thank you so much for watching. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye.